The digital instrumentals of Café's Dream use a sample of a cowbell detuned several octaves to give the illusion of a much larger instrument. In real world terms, that indeed might be the sound of a cowbell weighing some three quarters of a ton, struck with a mallet weighing as much as the wielding percussionist's body, or in smaller and more economical ensembles, by simply dropping the said percussionist from a height onto the instrument. Regrettably, the ritualized abuse of percussionists by composers is somewhat frowned upon, and therefore we have been compelled to consider a more humane option. The score indicates two varieties of sound here, with all of the technical precision required to unambiguously communicate the compositional intent. It refers, in the first place, to clangs of three pitches in a middling register and of strictly limited duration, and a crash consisting of a loud, low, and extremely long sustaining sound. The clangs are very nearly within the bounds of what is already termed junk percussion, which is not considered too extraordinary. The crash specifically entails several non-trivial engineering challenges mostly related to that simple principle whereby instruments producing lower-pitched sounds are of necessity much larger. The crash is also required to be fairly loud, and thus the instrument must be able to withstand and radiate an appropriate amount of kinetic energy, which also implies a fairly heavy instrument. After much consideration and compromise, and recourse to the annals of historical percussionistic innovation and knowledge, it is our considered position that the solution yielding maximal utility and economy is to mutilate a steel puck bench. This provides us with a mass of steel bars upon a heavy frame approximately 2 meters wide divisible between two musicians, in effect a large, barely tuned bass glockenspiel. The clangs may be accommodated with little to no alteration, save perhaps the rigid attachment of small wooden blocks to damp vibration, and the light trimming of some of the bars to effect distinct tuning. The crash would be produced by freeing the bars from the frame entirely save at one end, welding them all together and striking them with a drop-forged kinetic energy impartation device, also known as a claw hammer. The effect could also be improved by directing a unison with a tam-tam, struck near the rim with a wooden drumstick. Let me be clear, it is not yet certain that the opera will make it as far as the stage, let alone to have a camera sat before that staging. Rest assured, however, that once we reach that juncture, Miguel would insist on such a recording. When you complete the Café and Andrew side quest, there are two things you are told, depending chiefly upon whether Andrew remains at the inn or not. Apparently, what we can gather from this is that their masks mean more than just the ceremony. They are a reminder of their first meeting and the promise they made when they were young. Undoubtedly, they've kept the tokens of that promise with them for years, keeping their wedding vows alive and real, real enough to touch. So you see, the sun and moon masks are not merely part of the trappings of ceremony. There are verifiable manifestations of their love, made real by the work of their own hands. This handiwork, this dedication, these labours, like those of love itself, once lost, are not so lightly replaced. To Sarkon, love is a coin. It can be bartered, traded, and obtained by subterfuge. To Café, love is worth chasing to the ends of Termina itself. In the opera, Skull Kid lacks the prominence requisite to fulfill either role in his own right. In fact, he only relates to the narrative to the extent that he relates to Majora herself. In contrast to the game, the opera introduces these characters some way into the first act, in Majora's aria, and by this time he is well and truly under her spell. 
there is thus very little opportunity for Skull Kid to act so much as autonomously, let alone consequentially. Let us suppose this is you, and this is me. You see, being on the other side of the world, I am a sufficient distance from most everything that I have no fear about knowing too much. But if I were to come across and tell you anything, I would thereafter have to... In actual fact, this practice still continues, and we would also. However, it can be difficult to ensure that injury is not visited upon other instruments when dropping musicians into orchestra pits, as opposed to in the more spacious concert hall. Were the opera's complement of brass musicians sufficient in number and mass to provide an appropriate buffer, the solution to this problem would be altogether simpler.